Okay, very good morning. It's Wednesday the 8th of July. Really three things I'm going to talk about in the briefing today. Uh, one is trade war, in particular focus on the Hong Kong dollar peg. Second is COVID-19, a quick update on that front. And then third, focus on the UK with Brexit talks and an upcoming important speech on fiscal stimulus from the Chancellor Rishi Sunak. So I hope everyone is doing well and ready for the day ahead. Don't forget as well that myself and the team are going to be doing a live webinar this evening starting at 5 p.m. London time. All you need to do is go on the link in the red in the description of this video and you'll be able to register for that. I'm going to be talking about risk management, a couple of examples, common mistakes, ways in which we try to get our traders to counteract that type of uh, activity in order to have more consistent um, success with their trading strategies. So yeah, look forward to seeing some of you online later on this evening. But let's have a look at what's going on in markets and from a overall cross asset point of view, a little bit of moderate risk off being observed going into the close on Wall Street uh, last night and then holding kind of in a sense in the Asia Pacific session. Uh, we'll talk about the, the dollar peg information or news in a little bit more detail shortly. But at the moment, you can see that gold having been elevated on that pop back through 1800 yesterday has held on to that in a fairly tight range in the overnight Asia Pacific session, uh, kind of restricted by yesterday's R2 and the overnight low at 1804 at the moment. Uh, so we are down about five bucks there, but as I said, still um, vaulting that 1800 once again in the futures at least. Comes with equity index futures, lower close on Wall Street last night. Um, actually, the Shanghai Composite climbed for the seventh session in a row. Elsewhere though, in other parts of the asia Pac region, generally equities were a little bit softer following on from that US lead. Uh, so still a bit of this kind of irrational exuberance perhaps on the side of the state media pump that we saw getting that retail market kind of galvanized in the local market in mainland China still at play to some degree and the market not being too phased beyond that the local market in Hong Kong about some of this latest trade rhetoric coming out of the reports about the, the currency peg. Uh, so Equity index futures are lower. The DAX, they're playing a bit of catch up and down about 118 here in the center left, you can see this morning. Uh, WTI crude is lower by about 22 cents, not much in the way of a dramatic reaction um, to, to crude after the API oil inventories last night. And you know, from a longer term daily continuation chart I'm looking at here, we continue to monitor the price quite intently as we, we are getting kind of squeezed in to around this $41 price point, which we've tested now multiple times, and that would be that level we were trading before the aggressive gap down upon OPEC's inability to strike an accord at the beginning of March. So it feels like oil at the moment just requires that catalyst to then get us through that level to break either way. Um, and obviously the key components we'll be looking out for here really are dependent on COVID on the demand side and then OPEC on the supply side uh, that will be quite telling things to monitor going forward. Uh, oil inventory obviously data coming from the DOE later whether or not that could be the catalyst perhaps but it's got to be pretty spectacular because last night's figures weren't that dramatic. You had a build of 2 million and if anything that goes against the notion of then breaking that upside level that we were just looking at on that daily chart in oil. Um, expectations were for a draw so a bit bearish on the headline. The gasoline number slightly deeper draw and uh, just did us a drawdown of 850,000 there. So um, yeah that was the oil picture but generally it's following the sentiment at least this morning of being a touch lower with the equity movement being seen and overall a bit of a reversal as you can see here in the Nasdaq on the center chart of what has been a relatively seesaw week. Pushed higher on Monday, came back, pushed up to record highs again and then a lot of people looking at those, those Bostic comments that we covered in yesterday's briefing about how he's kind of a, if anything, more typically a leaning hawk but sounding quite dovish about the prospects of the US economy on the notion of second waves and um, the delayment of reopening of the economy and we've come back down again. And so that was why I really started with the calendar as a main focal point to kick off this session uh, because if you remember back on Monday when I did the kind of look ahead for the week, this was one of my main parts of my routine that really is 
um, fundamentally key to the way I look at markets from what I do. And that is on Sunday, my forward-looking preparation for the week ahead, where I like to kind of visualize what that week might entail. And so I kind of plot in the key fundamental events. So not looking at every single data point like this calendar would suggest here, but looking at like, okay, what are the, the key four or five data points? What are the key meetings on say the Brexit front or the trade war or COVID and these types of things? And it gives me an idea then about the type of week that I can be expecting. And from a calendar perspective, this week is really dull, really quiet. And I think that leads to then this kind of a little bit of indecision which we've been seeing in these types of markets. So I think already before the week begins, you can kind of manage, if you like, your kind of approach, your expectation to try and harness then not over trading, not being too aggressive, not buying into these kind of trends that are going to be particularly sustainable. Given the market, if anything, I'd say we're probably due a little bit of a period of consolidation, particularly in the US equity market after we've been quite rampant, obviously coming back up from very depressed levels. Um, but look, let's get our teeth into some of the main stories and I'm going to kick off with the first one, which is, let me be clear here, it's not moving global markets right now. It would be quite interesting when the US come in because this is a big talking point, of course. But what I wanted to do here was just break down some of the key elements of this particular subject about the dollar peg and the fact that Trump aides are supposedly weighing proposals to undermine Hong Kong's dollar peg. And obviously this comes as the kind of evolution of the trade war. This is just another element, but potentially a very important one if we were to ever get to this point. Importantly though, as I said, if you look at global markets, they are little phased. And I'm gonna show you a sequence of charts as well, uh, domestically looking at the, uh, a couple of different things in the options market, but also locally in the Hang Sang about why probably the likelihood of this actually materializing is very little. So I'll give my overall assessment before um, after I actually explain the situation. So what have we got here? What is going on? Well, first of all, I guess uh, for those who are new to markets, you've got to understand that what is the purpose of a dollar peg in the first place? Like why would someone like Hong Kong or China, in fact, want to have this? Well, a dollar peg is used to essentially stabilize uh, an exchange rate between two key trading partners. Now, a country that pegs its currency to the US dollar seeks to keep its currency uh, value low. And that would make sense, right? For a country like China, which historically has always been an exporter and their biggest client or customer in this sense would be that of the United States of America who are importing a lot of these goods. So what it does then, it gives people clarity, confirmation, a definitive level of which then uh, they know that they can trade upon in terms of actual physical trade. Uh, so that's why it exists. Um, what's happening here is the idea of striking against the Hong Kong dollar peg, uh, perhaps by limiting the ability of Hong Kong banks basically to buy US dollars. Uh, that's been raised as part of a broader discussion among advisors to the Secretary of State Pompeo uh, and hasn't been elevated yet though to senior levels of the White House which Bloomberg, and a lot of this is coming from sources, so it's not official commentary. Uh, they're suggesting it hasn't really gained too much traction yet. It's just one of the options on the table as part, part of the course of um, the negotiation ongoing between the US and China. Uh, apparently the proposal faces very strong opposition from others in the administration uh, who worry that such a move would only hurt Hong Kong banks and the US in itself and not so much China. Again, don't forget that by having a stable exchange rate, the US is highly dependent on importing goods as well from China. So that could be almost self-harming in a way. Uh, another person had cautioned that the idea of attacking the dollar peg is lower on the list of uh, possible options now under discussion. Uh, those ideas include things like cancelling the US-Hong Kong extradition treaty, ending cooperation with Hong Kong's police, as well as another thing that's on the agenda. Um, to give you a bit of context in terms of numbers, uh, the dollar peg is underpinned by about 440 billion US dollars of foreign exchange reserves, and Hong Kong has had its uh, currency pegged to the US dollar since the year I was born, in 1983. So, a uh, very memorable year, of course. Um, 
One possible way for Trump to attack the peg, and this was an interesting snippet I saw from, a, from an analyst who was commenting on this this morning. So one possible way for Trump to attack the peg would be for the US Treasury to limit American banks from providing dollar funding to Hong Kong and Chinese banks, which would drive the cost for such funding higher. Uh, but this analyst went on to say it's unlikely because China could retaliate by essentially taking action against US assets and obviously China is a phenomenally large holder and buyer of US treasuries and also US stocks and it could also reverberate and destabilize pegs elsewhere especially those maintained by the US allies in the Middle East so you disrupt one it's going to potentially have ramifications for all these other trade partners that they have in particular those in the Middle East where they purchase obviously a lot of crude oil for example which is again very important for the United States of America so a couple of things here visually that I think are quite telling um, this is not something that I would typically look at um, day to day I don't really look at the options market a great deal but uh, what was quite interesting with this graphic uh, was look we're encapsulating a, a period of time here and we have the summer of last year up to the summer of this year so we're looking essentially at the last 12 months and what this is looking at is Hong Kong uh, dollar risk reversals which is basically a gauge of trader sentiment in the options market and what you can see here is it's really little, little changed I mean it's pretty flat um, reflecting a way lower probability of a peg break than during the height the reason why this was so elevated and the risk reversal indic indicative of potential for large price uh, currency swings we're nowhere near that level and that was um, uh, promoted if you like this increase by the ongoing unrest we were seeing with those escalation in Hong Kong protests at the time so comparatively what the options market would tell you here is that they're fairly comfortable that although this is being put on the table as a potential discussion point that it is very far away from actually being at the point of being implemented and and before I give you my view and why I think that is a particularly important point let me just show you two other things this is the Hang Seng the local stock index of course traded in Hong Kong and it's been very volatile on the back of this but net net hasn't seen a great deal of movement one bank in particular that has seen a bit of downside and worth keeping on at the, uh, keeping an eye on at the cash open in the FTSE in the UK is HSBC uh, they do draw more than two-thirds of their pre-tax income from Hong Kong of course um, and they were down about 3% in local trade there domestically in the overnight session so worth keeping an eye on them at the open um, the other thing then was yeah the, these bank stocks so they have come standard chartered is another one that which has a high proportion of exposure uh, in that region uh, and would be more sensitive than other banking stocks than most uh, so those would be two I'd keep an eye on as well at the UK open but overall um, you know the point here is as I was kind of alluding to um, the likelihood of this happening is, is relatively small and for me this is more of that kind of uh, political gamesmanship the posturing of suggesting the kind of a more nuclear option which is highly unlikely to be deployed but from a Trump and an administration strategy it's one of those things where you just want to plant the seed that this is look sending a message to China that we would consider this and that's almost serving its purpose uh, in itself I, I, I highly see this as unlikely that this would materialize at least at this point in time or anytime soon we'd need to see much more dramatic escalation at this point and to be quite frank going into a US election year I think disrupting that dollar peg and the ramifications it would have on trade and on what other dollar peg relationships around the world as we were just mentioning about the Middle East I think this would be completely self-harming at a completely inappropriate time for Donald Trump so I think for all the headline buzz that this is creating I think it's all a lot of noise quite frankly at this point in time I think that's why largely markets have been fairly sanguine about the issue for the time being on the notion of China uh, I'm not sure if you guys caught it but Eddie wasn't able to do a video on Sunday so he kindly did one yesterday where he talked about TikTok now I for one probably a reflection of my age 
Uh, I've never used TikTok, and quite frankly, I don't even know what it is until I or was until I watched Eddie's video. But away from the social media and the the comedic side of that platform, uh, Eddie did a really great video actually, and it was quite interesting hearing him explain how this kind of idea, perhaps, about the surveillance of China using that technology to watch then and obtain data and information particularly on Americans as well as people based in in Western Europe and how this becomes a suspiciously time uh, point of the year going into a US election of course and those connotations still lingering about Russia involvement in 2016 and and so on so check that out if you go on the Amplify um, YouTube channel you just basically need to scroll down Eddie's got his own playlists where he explains these market concepts and TikTok is his latest one, and it's definitely worth a watch, very interesting. Um, elsewhere then, other headlines, you've got Brexit updates. So basically Boris Johnson's warned Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, that look, we're ready to walk without a trade deal uh, if the EU wasn't prepared to compromise. Now I think this again, um, you know, I've quite enjoyed in a way how much more prevalent politics has become um, in financial markets. It certainly wasn't like this when I started back in kind of 06. Um, and I enjoy it because I have to start thinking with a different kind of mindset where you know what politicians say and what they do are very different things. And what they're trying to do is create a narrative and try to create a certain response from the, the public from a popularity point of view more than anything. And so you know, it's really interesting here with, with the pound and how it's been behaving. Yesterday, actually, the pound was outperforming. And obviously, a lot of people scratching their heads about, you know, what's going on. There's still a lot of uncertainty. But, you know, for me, the the passage of what was then a kind of major milestone, which was whether or not the UK would request an extension, which obviously they haven't done. For me, there's a little bit of breathing room here at the moment for these negotiations to go on. They're obviously continuing in earnest at the moment and, and talks are being accelerated. But in terms of milestones, it's really more the kind of autumn time when we're looking for a potential deal to be struck. So if I was Dominic Cummings, I'm not even gonna mention Boris Johnson, if I was Dominic Cummings, I'd be absolutely, let's play hardball. Um, let's let's say, look, we're ready to walk, and we go almost right back to the beginning again, in the aggressive, assertive tone. Uh, you know, a negotiation does tend, like any, to go in an ebb and flow. It looked like there were compromises being made, uh, and now we go back to the hardball. And given a little bit of uh, of room to maneuver with that rhetoric, because the pound is trading quite quite solid at the moment, if anything despite the economic underlying situation. Um, negotiations are still stuck on the same points, really. Um, fishing rights, the future influence of EU courts on UK law, um, how far Britain will be able to loosen its rules in, in order to better have access to the European single market. So nothing really has changed too much. Uh, the UK, what's being tabled is they'd be ready to leave the transition period, so the end of this year, on what's been classified as Australian terms if an agreement cannot be reached. And what Australian terms basically means is Australia do not have a comprehensive trade deal with the EU. So basically much of EU trade goes through the main tariff rates of the WTO. However, there are some specific agreements tied to certain areas. So it's kind of a, a lesser, well, it's much more of a broad agreement where they've isolated a couple points rather than the more um, more encompassing agreement that currently exists between the UK and the EU. So yeah, overall, I would not be thinking short-term intraday that this is a real definable change in tone and that would make me want to be massively short the pound. That's not the case. This is just strategic political negotiation that's happening at the moment. The other thing, of course, that's happening today is uh, Rishi Sunak is going to come out, he's going to take centre stage, he's going to unveil a couple of new ways in order to promote growth in our country and obviously get ahead of the problem that things like um, the government's propping up of furlough schemes cannot last forever. So there's a couple of different things to be aware of that are likely to be announced today from the UK Chancellor and one is a £2 billion programme to pay wages for more than 200,000 young workers. Uh, basically, it's going to be the centerpiece of a three-point plan to protect 
support and create jobs. So, you know, the marketing machine, uh, again, that is Dominic Cummings in full flow with these key words, protect, support, create, um, is likely to resonate to a certain degree. Um, other things Sunak will announce is potentially a stamp duty holiday is being discussed for homes costing up to £500,000. Uh, that's being reported in the Sun this morning. The FT has reported considering a temporary cut to VAT to help boost the hospitality sector. However, there's been a little bit of um, mixed reporting about the timing around that specific point. Um, and over the past week, to put this in context, the Treasury has outlined more than £4 billion in measures to promote jobs, skills and energy efficiency. Johnson has also brought forward that £5 billion in accelerated infrastructure spending. Uh, the government has also outlined £1.6 billion uh, bailout earlier this week to help struggling theatres uh, and music venues which haven't been yet able to open because of social distancing. So there's, a, again, a lot of just getting the checkbook out in order to um, really do two things. One, promote an economic recovery and two, appear that you're being proactive in trying to do whatever is necessary to support the economy and people's jobs. Um, so yeah, more of that to come from, from uh, Sunak today. All of this, of course, does mean that the Office of Budget Responsibility uh, in the UK, the OBR, estimate that Sunak's efforts to support businesses and workers through this crisis will cost more than essentially £130 billion. Uh, and that's already pushed national debt in our country um, to the size of the country's GDP, or above the size of the country's GDP for the first time since basically the 1960s. So again, national debt above GDP for the first time you know, in 50, 60 years. Although that's bad, remember how markets function. Markets, uh, as intelligent as the people that may operate in the markets, you know, human irrationality suggests that we must confront and deal with the first and foremost danger, and that is we're in an economic plight at the moment. So as much as things like an over-stretched um, budget, which is pushing national debt ever higher, is somewhat troublesome, maybe in the long term, in the short term, you know, the more they throw it at the better is the short-term response if you're trading um, intraday markets or short-term price movement. How much of this uh, announcement from Sunak is really going to move the market? I would say very little. The way that these types of events tend to unfold is, look, I've just listed you everything that's going to happen today, so we already know about it. And if there was any move to happen, it's already happened. So perhaps then some of the bump up that we had in cable was a little bit of a reflection of that. So if that were the case, then you know he's got to now deliver on what these press speculation has, has reported. On the COVID side, what's going on? Well, there's not really too many differences. Australia continues to be quite a, a focal point in terms of the rapid escalation that we've seen coming out of Melbourne. Uh, US still increasing, UK decreasing, and Europe fairly flat. So from a statewide level, yeah, it continues to paint the same picture, but equally so, there's the, you know, the kind of intensity around the kind of obsession with COVID has dissipated, I would say, to a certain degree. Uh, and it's almost like the markets have become more comfortable and started to price in the fact that, look, this isn't spooking us as it was only a few weeks ago, literally one and a half, two weeks ago. So these these need to be monitored still. Um, and I guess we're getting to the point like what we saw in this uh, first official, uh, initial acceleration phase to the eventual peak. Um, where does this second wave start to peak? and when will be will be quite key. So keep an eye out for those in the afternoon. But again, I think unlikely to be a real game changer as far as the intraday is concerned. Um, so calendar for today, uh, it is very quiet, as I've mentioned for the, the entire week, really, uh, today and tomorrow, very quiet indeed on the, the fixed data front. So there's nothing really coming up this morning. Uh, and then you've got the oil inventories this afternoon. That's pretty much it. Speaker wise, uh, obviously looking out for Sunak in his fiscal statement later. De Guindos uh, speaking, uh, Vice President of the ECB at 9.45 London time uh, and then a bit later on this afternoon. Um, and then you've got a 29 billion 10-year note auction coming out of the US with a bobble auction in Germany as well for any fixed income traders. But look, that's it from me. Hopefully I'll see you online later this evening for our webinar. Um, I'm going to be joined by Sam and a few of the other guys. So 
Uh, I look forward to talking to you all in, in real time and fielding your questions. Again, the link for that, if you want to register, is in the description of the video. Okay, guys, that's it. Have a good day ahead, and I'll see you tomorrow.